Good afternoon from Bladensburg, Maryland. I am in the waterfront park at Bladensburg, so I'm on the east bank of the Anacostia River. Um, we are upstream from the Navy Yard, so into Maryland. This was the site of a battle in the War of 1812. The battle took place on August the 24th, 1814, and it was an engagement between uh, British forces, predominantly British Army, though with uh, some Marine detachments attached from the fleet, against American forces um, comprising a small number of regulars and a very large body of Maryland, DC, and late in the battle, Virginia Militia. So that's where we are today. Let's see if we can just get a view of the Anacostia behind me. So I wanted to talk about this battle for a number of reasons. Um, primarily it's a War of 1812 battle and the War of 1812 is not often discussed and its battlefields are little known. Um, secondly, because in the War of 1812, this is really a pivotal battle. Um, it is part of the battle for Washington, D.C. So sometimes people regard that as two separate battles, but really it's two phases of the same battle. Um, the engagement, the main battle, takes place between uh, the two opposing military forces here at Bladensburg, and then there is a retreat of the American forces um, towards Washington DC and towards Georgetown which then leads to the sacking of Georgetown that evening. So really it is the same battle and um, considering uh, that follows on immediately from Bladensburg, the encounter here at Bladensburg is the sacking of the nation's capital. The Battle of Bladensburg therefore is a pivotal battle in the War of 1812. Um, then there's just kind of like a couple of other reasons which is um, the uh, folklore of the battle itself, uh, the poem The Bladensburg Races, and in which case uh, there's a written poem written in the aftermath of the battle uh, in mocking the uh, American leadership, in particular President Madison, Secretary of State, uh, James Monroe, and the senior generals that were here on the field that day for running away. Um, so there's that folklore that surrounds the battle. There is also the story of Commodore Barney's detachment of Blue Jackets from the Chesapeake Flotilla uh, with a detachment of uh, Marines from the um, Marine Barracks at the Navy Yard and their heroic last stand on the American third line of defense up on the hill there, uh, which they were overrun and forced to retreat. But um, that is a sort of um, in, in depictions of the battle um, because it was an ignominious defeat for American arms there are not many um, epic paintings of the battle um, so if you do see an illustration it may be of um, Barney and uh, his crew manning their 312 pounder cannon um, also uh, of interest to me is that one of the regiments that fought here on the British side that day was 1st Battalion 44th Foot, 44th East Essex Regiment of Foot, and I just happened to be from um, East Essex. That's my place of birth. That's really my hometown regiment for this period. So anybody born or recruited to the army um, from Colchester, which is where I lived, uh, would have possibly ended up. And uh, the idea that there were local boys from uh, small towns and farming villages where I come from that were actually here at that battle is, uh, is a little personal connection that I feel to this battle. So let's set this battle in some context. We're talking about um, the War of 1812. Uh, this is the second year of the war. It's 1814, the summer of that year. Uh, the campaign Sorry, just dropped the network connection there for a moment. The war started reasonably well for the Americans. There are some early successes, um, notably the push into Canada, but they are then driven out of Canada and the war seems to be going poorly for the American forces. The, 
British impose a naval blockade of the Chesapeake Bay, which will also blockade the Potomac River. Um, so that will block access to Washington DC and the Port of Baltimore. They also uh, blockade the Delaware River, which um, prevents traffic to the ports of uh, Chester and Wilmington and Philadelphia. So some of America's major ports in this mid-Atlantic region are under blockade. Uh, Admiral George Cockburn, at Rear Admiral George Cockburn commanding the uh, British fleet in the Chesapeake, in particular during 1813 and the beginning of 1814, launches a series of 100 or so raids up and down the Chesapeake Bay. Some of these are major raids, such as the raid on Havre de Grace, Maryland, uh, in which um, the town is uh, attacked by a landing party and uh, put to the torch and most of the buildings in the town are completely destroyed. Others are not so large, there are some smaller engagements where they uh, come ashore, burn a farmhouse or come ashore and burn a tobacco barn. But up and down the Chesapeake Bay for over a year the British Navy has uh, effectively controlled the waterway um, and been able to travel at will, been able to attack and land detachments of troops, marines, um, sailors up and down the Chesapeake Bay and attack certainly t um, reasonably sized towns, Havre de Grace, uh, Queenstown and so forth, um, but have obviously avoided the large city of Baltimore itself. It's uh, regarded as a nest of pirates on account of the number of schooners, the armed schooners that are operating out of Baltimore as privateers. So they've avoided the large city, they've avoided Baltimore, but um, for a year Cockburn has been sailing up and down the Chesapeake Bay, wrecking havoc, causing mayhem and destruction. So the war is going quite poorly for the Americans at this point. The war is poorly funded, um, so the number of regular troops in commission in this area is relatively small. America is, America is still with this tradition of maintaining a very small standing army, a very small body of professional trained men that are available on call, and by and large relying on militia, calling up state militias. So in this area and with this battle, we're talking about approximately 1,000 regulars, um, which includes a detachment of light dragoons, it includes a composite battalion of uh, regular infantry, and it includes a detachment of uh, naval blue jackets from the Chesapeake Flotilla who've been landed and a small detachment of United States Marines. So that's l possibly less than a thousand men, 960, 970 men. Um, 6,200, so 6,200 militia present for duty. Um, Maryland militia, District of Columbia militia, and later in the battle, um, really too late to make a difference, Virginia militia begin to arrive as well. So the American force of about 7,000 to 7,500 men is predominantly militia. So some of these militia are well trained, like the 5th Maryland, the Dandy 5th. Um, they are provided with uni well provided with uniforms, um, they muster for training, um, they have um, good functional muskets, um, which they have fired in training and they know what they're doing. Um, other militias are uh, county militias in which no uniforms are issued, um, a man may have a um, tie a silk scarf around his hat or a colour scarf around his hat so that they know which side they're on. Um, they have Some men have muskets from state armories, others have bought pieces from home. Um, so there's some problems with commonality of uh, ammunition and they don't train that often. If they muster, they muster at a holiday, or they muster at a carnival event, uh, they drink a lot of hard cider, uh, they drink a lot of uh, um, whiskey and uh, they have a good party. When they actually, whether they actually muster and do any drill uh, is, is doubtful really. So the quality of the militia, although the militia is a large body and the American force is by far larger than the British force. Um, the American force is of dubious quality because of the um, lack of training with the militia. So the British have landed a major force of um, 4,500 men. So 4,500 men doesn't sound like a lot today, but for an expeditionary force of the time, 4,500 men is quite a significant body to have transported across the sea in um, wooden ships and uh, brought to the American shores uh, to fight in, on land. Uh, these men are, a lot of these men are veterans of the Peninsula War, which has been fighting in Spain and Portugal and into southern France between the years um, 1809 and 
18, 13, 18, 14. So a lot of these men are veterans of, of battles such as Talavera, Salamanca, uh, Vittorio, etc. So a lot of these men are hardened troops, these British troops that have come over here. Um, and so they're facing against uh, American regular army, which has fought no real engagement since the Revolutionary War and is fighting against militia, which have seen um, certainly in Maryland and District of Columbia and Virginia have seen no engagements at all uh, really since either, again, the Revolutionary War. I mean, this is no longer a frontier territory in which the militia is called out for Indian fighting. Um, you know, this is a, a sedate colonial um, part of the country and where the militia is, uh, uh, you know, not regarded as a, as a necessary body to uh, maintain the defense of the, of the states. The, the naval forces available to the United States in this area um, are referred to as the Chesapeake Flotilla under Commodore Joshua Barney. Um, he has no significantly large ships under his command. Uh, he does have a small sloop which he uses as his flagship, but the majority of his, his ships in this flotilla are small gunboats. Um, it's also known as the Mosquito Fleet on account of how it can, you know, nip you and bite you and, and disappear and you can't slap it down. So these are small ships and the tactic of Barney is to defend the creeks and the outlets of the Chesapeake Bay. So as I said, Cockburn's been coming up and down the Chesapeake Bay with ships of the line, with frigates and uh, bombarding towns and landing troops and landing marines and attacking. And uh, Barney's response to that is rather than fight a ship-to-ship -ship engagement in the Chesapeake Bay, um, first of all you'd have to uh, bring your preciously small navy. The United States Navy at this point consists of um, no more than 10 ships that are capable of fighting a ship-to-ship -ship engagement. Um, the British have brought 50 with them, just 50 to the United States alone. The British have, they've just concluded uh, the majority of their war with Napoleon, they have a navy of hundreds of ships available to them. So they've brought 50 to the United States up against what they believe is 10 American ships, so an outnumber them, them five to one. Um, the United States Navy does not wish to fight um, ship to ship engagements unless it really has to. So it's relying on these little gunboat fleets, this Mosquito fleet, the Chesapeake flotilla, to do its work. Now they've been hampered into, pushed into a corner and defeated at the Battle of St. Leonard's. And so rather than um, allow these gunboats to be captured, Barney has ordered those gunboats to be burned to the waterline. Uh, the, ship, the ships are destroyed, these little gunboats are destroyed. Uh, he takes his men on land, so his blue jackets are, are on land. He brings them on land with uh, cutlasses, boarding pikes, um, some muskets, some naval service pistols. Uh, joins with a small battalion of Marines, 120 Marines, are drafted to him from um, the Marine Barracks at the Navy Yard and forms a uh, Naval Marine Detachment to back up the American Army. So his naval forces become an infantry battalion. Uh, he also draws three 12 powder guns from the Navy Yard, so he actually has some artillery support for that force as well. So August the 24th, 1814. The British have landed their force earlier that month, a few days before, at Benedict, Maryland, um, on the Chesapeake Bay, and they've been moving inland. They've been following um, farm roads and rivers, and they've come to, well, along now what is uh, Kenilworth Avenue. Behind, behind me is the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad tracks, which is now a CSX freight track, so if we get a freight train go past, it's on the old B&O Railroad. Beyond that is the old Kenilworth Road, and that's the way that the British Army approached that day. They are, um, I'm on the east bank of the Anacostia, the west bank, and Washington DC is to there, so they're approaching from the south and coming along this east bank. The reason they're coming to this east bank is that they want to take the Washington DC Road, the Washington Turnpike. The Washington Turnpike will cross the Anacostia from Maryland at this point. So the point at which they're coming across, you, know, you can see there's a bridge behind me. It's not the original bridge, obviously, this is a reconstructed bridge. So there is a bridge here, and there is also up river, there is a ford, which can be forded by um, carriage. So if you're traveling to Washington DC, and it's a lovely sunny afternoon like it is today on a Tuesday afternoon, you're traveling to Washington DC. If you're on foot or on a single horse, you can approach over this old bridge here. Uh, the bridge was wide enough to stand three men abreast at the time, so you could get three men abreast it. Uh, you could also get a horse across it. 
You couldn't get a wagon across it and you certainly couldn't get an artillery piece across it. If you wanted to do that, you had to go upriver and ford upriver at a lower point and come across and rejoin the road. So when the British Army arrives here, um, its 4,500 men are divided into three brigades. Um, one under Thornton, which would be a light brigade um, comprising uh, 85th Bucks Light Infantry and uh, the light infantry companies from the other regiments and a detachment of Marines. Uh, second Brigade, I believe under Brook, um, will be comprised of the uh, 4th and the 44th foot, so that's my Essex boys again, the 4th and the 44th foot. And the 3rd Brigade will comprise the um, 21st foot and, oh gosh, uh, yes, 21st foot and the uh, Royal Marine Battalion under Colonel Patterson. So there's three brigades uh, of British troops arrive here that day. So as you can see, no cavalry support and um, no notable artillery support. So this is going to be an infantry assault. It's going to be an infantry assault across a river, across a narrow bridge, against entrenched American positions. The Americans have established defensive lines on the west bank of the Anacostia. Um, they've arranged those initially in one good strong defensive line um, where they've started to dig earthworks and emplace their artillery. They have good artillery and they have 23 six pounder guns, they have two large 18 pounder guns and as I said Barney's naval detachment has bought three 12 pounder guns from the navy yard. So they have um, 28 guns available to them, a significant uh, number of artillery. So this is going to be British infantry trying to storm across a narrow bridge in the face of uh, heavy artillery fire. However, uh, there's a problem with the American command and the American command structure. So the American forces here are under uh, uh, Brigadier General uh, William Wider. He is the field commander that day and he makes his dispositions um, which he thinks are uh, adequate to withstand the British assault. Um, what he doesn't account for in his thinking is that he's going to be interfered with and he's going to be interfered with not by military superiors but by political superiors. So the president of the day is uh, James Madison, little Jimmy Madison. His secretary of state is um, James Monroe. Um, so James Monroe is a veteran of the Revolutionary War, thinks himself uh, quite the military man, even though despite his advancing age and that he hasn't been in combat for a very long time. And also he's the United States Secretary of State. He's not the Secretary of War. He has no relationship with the Army whatsoever. But he says to President Madison, well, let's go out to the battlefield, little Jim, and uh, you know, you can get up on the hill on your horse and you can watch, you can watch us defeat the British and I'll go down there and I'll tell old Wyner where he needs to put his men because I don't think he's put his men in the right position. So um, James Monroe arrives and in his arrogance he comes down and does not even bother to consult with uh, the field commander, the American field commander, actually gets down amongst the American troops and starts moving units himself. So the United States Secretary of State has come down here and started uh, moving units himself. So. Um, yeah, that would be like if Nixon uh, arrived at um, the fall of the American embassy in, uh, or the evacuation of the American embassy in the fall of Saigon, if Nixon had arrived on a horse to watch and Henry Kissinger had gone down on the street and started to organise the withdrawal himself. So, um, you know, because, I mean, Henry Kissinger had been a sergeant during World War II, so he had military experience. Anyway, it's that kind of ludicrous situation which has happened here. So Monroe thinks that the best thing to do is rather than have a god solid one strength line, he wants defence in depth. So instead of having um, a strong line that can repulse the British right at the river's edge, he moves some units back to be a support position. Fair enough, okay, you want some men in support. And then he moves additional men even further back to be a third line of defence. The men in the third line of defence are the most experienced men. They are the um, uh, Barney's detachment of Blue Jackets and Marines and also the um, small battalion of regulars. So the most experienced troops are now back in a third line of defence. So there is a defensive line of um, uh, militia rifle companies here along the river with some six pounder guns. They are protecting an earthwork line along the river. Behind them now 
is a second line of defence comprising of um, the majority of the DC and Maryland militia regiments. They are in a second line of defence, but they've been pulled back beyond effective musket range. So even though they're in su supposed to be in support of that first line of American defence, they can't offer actual any physical support, any fire support to that first line of defence. That's, that's a big mistake. And then the same is true of the third line of defence. The third line of defence is too far back to support the second line of defence. Um, the flanks of the American position are held by militia, so they're weakly held. And nobody has gone upstream to the ford and garrisoned the ford and put guns on the ford to prevent a crossing there. So the British attack um, is in two phases. It's a two-pronged attack. Thornton's Brigade, that's that brigade of light infantry, um, they're going to storm this bridge. They're going to cross the river right here at this bridge. Meanwhile, um, Brooke with 2nd Brigade, so that's the 44th foot and the 4th foot, they're going to make a flanking movement upstream to where they know there's a ford, cross at the ford and come round onto the American flank. So it's a British right flanking move across the ford which is going to come and hit the Americans in their left in a left that is held, the flank held by militia. So let's just have a, I'm not, obviously not gonna wade into the Anacostia River and <laughs> walk across uh, the ford. So let's cross this bridge. Let me just switch the camera view. So as I said, in 1814, this bridge was actually slightly narrower. This is a newer iron bridge with a wooden, wooden base. And so this bridge today, if I stretch my, hang on, I'm going to measure this myself while I'm standing here, one, I think I could get five across here, so comfortably four across. At the time it was only three across. There's a little man on a ute coming down here, so I'm going to let him pass. So as you can see, the Anacostia is mud flat, mud flat, mud flat, Anacostia River, and then on that far side there is um, a reconstructed earthwork as well. So. The bridge here in 1814 was narrower. You could only get three men across it at a time. So you could get three men across it. You could get a horse across it. So when Thornton's brigade is assaulting, Thornton, Thornton's brigade is approximately 1,500 men charging down that hill without an artillery preparation into the face of rifle fire and into the face of cannon fire moving across this bridge, closely packed in a tight column of three men abreast. So um, would you want to be the ensign at the lead of that, carrying a colour? Would you want to be the men in the advance company, maybe the grenadier company, pushing forward as the assault troops? You probably would not, because you're going to take the fire first. So Thornton's men assault this bridge, and they're driven back and it's understandable why they're driven back they're charging into um, rifle fire uh, the militia companies that are lining the bank down here in support of the cannon are not armed with muskets smoothbore muskets they're armed with rifles from home um, so longer range accurate rifles so these are riflemen you can consider them to be the elite of the militia the best shots and so they can pick people off one by one and then also the cannon are opening fire as well. So they're beaten back that first time, but they make a renewed assault. Um, Thornton knows, and General Ross can see from his General, um, General Ross, Robert Ross, commanding the British on the field, can see from his position that that American first line is weakly held and badly supported. So one good push and you can break that line. So Thornton's men launch a second attack across this bridge and this time the attack is going to succeed. One of the reasons that it succeeds is that that 2nd Brigade under Colonel Brooke has moved upstream to about where the, uh, just beyond where the highway bridge is now on the turn of that river where there's a fordable section of the river and Brooke's Brigade has begun to cross there with the 44th East Essex in the lead and are already coming in on the American flank. 
So Thornton's second attack across this bridge, combined with the flank attack by Brooke's brigade, overwhelms and panics this American first line. They are then going to fall back. And they're going to fall back in a hurry. <clears throat> Some very large trucks there. I don't know whether I really want to go up that way today. <laughs> As you can see, I'm walking across this bridge because I'm a grey-haired, old, unfit man. Uh, these would have been slightly younger men than me. And they'd want to get across this bridge as quickly as they possibly can so that they could disperse, they could fan out, deploy into line, not be a concentrated, concentrated body that is going to be hit and attacked by this cannon fire. Okay, so as we move across the bridge now, in the Colmar Manor, which is a residential neighborhood. As you can see, we're moving across where the American first line is to where the American second line is. If you will, bear with me, I'm gonna flip my camera back to me. So, I'm now on the west bank of Yanacostia. And the first line of American defense has been uh, wrecked. It's been pushed back completely. I'm just going to take a water break. As I say in so many of my live streams, the most important thing you can do when you come out on a battlefield walk, whether it's a hot day, whether it's a cold day, is hydrate before you go out and stay hydrated during the tour. Um, but talking dehydrates you. And let's get out of the way of this dump truck. One day I will do a tour that is not interrupted by trucks, helicopters, um, trains, um, screaming children, etc. So. The British have now crossed the river, seized both crossing points, so the 3rd Brigade can be brought across, reinforcements can be brought across, and they can move up now towards the higher ground behind us, where the Americans have established their second line of defence. Um, the American second line of defence is comprised predominantly of as I said, Maryland and DC militia regiments. Those Maryland and DC militia regiments are mostly ununiformed. Um, so they've been mobilized from their hometowns and their home counties. They've come out here and assembled at Bladensburg. For some of these men, it's the first time that their company has mustered with other companies of the regiments so you may notionally be in a regiment of um, militia from Harford County or Cecil County, but um, you probably only muster at Bel Air or at Havre de Grace or at Baxter's Crossroads or Hall's Crossroads or, or Harford Town. You're, you're probably mustering with a small number of men in your company and the opportunity for you to muster as an entire regiment, certainly to train and maneuver as an entire regiment, has been very, very limited. So some, for some of these militia units that have arrived here at Bladensburg, this is the first time that they've served together as a battalion, as a regiment. And as you can imagine, the unit cohesion of that unit, the morale of that unit, the willingness of that unit to trust the men on either side of it. You may know the men in your own company, these could be 25, 30 men that you know from church, you know from the neighbouring farm. These are men that you know, that you grew up with, that you trust. So you trust the men in your own company, but the men to your flank, who might be from further up the county, or might belong to a different denomination of church, or might even, God forbid, belong to a different county in Maryland, um, you don't know any of those men really that well. You don't know whether you're going to trust them or not. In, in your defense. So when that second line of militia 
and this is the bulk of the American position. So this second line of militia, upwards of 3,000 men, when that is hit by the British troops, and it's hit by trained British regulars who are angry that they've been fired on, and uh, their blood is up, and they are coming in with uh, the bayonet. So they will, you know, they will halt, they will present, they will fire a volley, and as soon as that volley is fired, the militia break. And when I say they break, I really mean they break. They literally turn and run. One of the men in the third line of defence, Charles Ball, uh, a blue jacket, a member of the Chesapeake militia, who's manning one of the 12-pounder guns under Barney, describes them as looking like sheep chased by dogs. So he doesn't mean sheep herded by dogs. He doesn't mean like, you know, where the shepherd is whistling and the well-trained collie is manoeuvring sheep around. He's talking about mad dogs, angry dogs. That's how he's looking at the British troops. That they're angry, mad dogs. They're trying to savage these sheep and they're sheep. They're running in all sorts of directions and following each other, absolutely leaderless without any sense of direction or purpose whatsoever. So it's a complete rout of that American second line. So the first line's been broken, the second line has been routed, and the three British brigades are now moving forward on that third line, which occupies a defensive position up beyond um, the dueling grounds. So uh, dueling is illegal, as we all know. Um, so if gentlemen wish to, wish to settle a matter of honour, they had to find a convenient place outside of town. So if you wanted to fight a duel in Washington DC, rather than fight in Washington DC itself, and perhaps you'll find yourself under arrest and uh, suffering prosecution, even perhaps for murder or manslaughter, um, they found dueling grounds out here in across the Maryland line near Bladensburg on this bank of the Anacostia River, just up on a high ground, is known as the and still known as the Dueling Grounds. Um, famously, that's where, um, in a duel, speaking of naval officers, we're going to be speaking of Commodore Burney, but if you want to look up Decatur, Stephen Decatur, that's where he was shot and mortally wounded in a duel, up there on those Dueling Grounds. So the British attack now goes in uphill, frontal assault. Um, there's really no other way to take this position. And they can see the Americans up on the hill. So as I said, that's that small battalion of regulars. It's Barney's Blue Jacket and Marine Detachment. And on either side of them is a militia regiment guarding the flanks. As soon as the British attack goes in, those flanking militia regiments also turn and break and begin an ignominious retreat. So the regulars and the Marines and the Blue Jackets a very small group indeed, are left alone on the top of that hill. Under assault now from three British brigades who are coming in at a determined pace. Now, perhaps the wisest thing that Commodore Barney could have done would have been to have cut and run. Spike his guns, so he has those three 12 pounders. So spike those guns so they can't be used against you maybe set a powder trail to your ammunition supply so you're going to blow, blow your gunpowder and get your men out. Um, there's two roads lead away from this battlefield. One is going to lead straight into Washington DC itself and one is going to bank around the river and come in from the north into Georgetown. Um, the majority of the militia don't know where they are so some of them flee towards Washington DC and some of them flee towards Georgetown. The British don't immediately pursue them because they have to defeat this third line. So this third line here, as I said, is the um, Barney's Blue Jackets. And this is, hang on, this bridge behind me is Washington Pikes. This is the road that still goes into Washington DC today. So on the high ground further up and I'm going to move so we can see up the pike and point towards where it is. Bridging across both sides of the pike with cannon on both sides of the pike is Commander uh, Commodore sorry, Joshua Burney with his blue jackets. 
on his right flank, which will be the British left flank, is the Marine Detachment under Captain Miller. And as I said, to Miller's flank was uh, Beale's Annapolis Militia Battalion, which is already broken. And to, excuse me, to um, Barney's left, which is the British right, will be the DC Militia under Smith, which will break and run. And then Scott is commanding that small battalion of US Army regulars, which um, without the militia support is also going to be um, uh, a defenseless. Scott receives an order to pull back um, to Washington DC to help defend Washington DC. So that small battalion of American regulars starts to pull back. Uh, Barney is now the only unit left on the field. Um, no more than 400 men, perhaps only 350 by this point in the battle, three cannon. Um, he has 120 marines which are armed with muskets, but the majority of his sailors, the majority of his blue jackets, some carry muskets, some carry firearms, uh, but the majority of them are armed with um, uh, boarding pikes and cutlasses and knives and cudgels against Thornton's Brigade coming up on them. So that Thornton's Brigade, as I said, is the uh, 85th Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, so the seasoned infantry battalion, um, and then three companies of light infantry merged together in a battalion as a provisional light infantry battalion, and a company of uh, uh, Royal Marines coming up with them as well. So that first brigade is coming on approximately, so they've taken about 200 casualties on the bridge, so we're talking about 1,300 men versus about 350 men, so the odds are overwhelming. Um, Barney does not retreat, he doesn't spike his guns. In fact, what he orders is he orders the men to charge. It's probably the last thing that Thornton and the British expected was that the small detachment would charge. They may have expected them to run, they may have expected them to um, stand and fight, but probably the last thing they expected them to do was to actually charge. So they charge, and as I said, a lot of these men are just armed with boarding pikes and cutlasses. And these are naval men, these are blue jackets, these are men from the United States Navy, these are men that have uh, mariners most of their life, and I'm just moving away the bicycle. Right. Um, so these are men not used to land combat. So when, you know, Barney says, okay boys, let's go get them, rather than shout, charge, the order is given, board them. It's as if you're like, coming from your ship and like leaping onto your opponent's ship to board your opponent's ship. So it's board them, board them. Um, so they go into a hand-to-hand -hand fight and of course the odds are not in their favour in this hand-to-hand -hand fight and they will be driven back. Um, the fight, the guns will be manned to the last. Uh, Bernie himself is wounded, shot down on the battlefield. There are very few survivors, but it's a tenacious defence. It is a tenacious defence put up by um, this improvised unit of um, sailors from the Chesapeake Flotilla and a small body of Marines really put up this last stand here at Bladensburg. So the battle itself has only lasted about two hours. The British arrived on the field at 12, looked over their positions, deployed their brigades, um, fired a few Congrave rockets, you know, by the rockets, red glare, fired a few Congrave rockets to spook the hell out of the Americans, and then commenced their assault around one o'clock in the afternoon. And the battle now has been going on for about two hours to three hours, and the Americans are in full retreat, and the British are in possession of the field. Now the British will need to stop, um, pick up their wounded, uh, move, move their dead, replenish their... Um, ammunition pouches, reorganise themselves before they move down into Washington DC, which is of course exactly what they're going to do that night. So let me just move under the road bridge here to the other side of the battlefield. So as I say, this is Washington Pike. In fact, let's not do that. Let's actually get up onto Washington Pike risk life and limb. <coughs> Perhaps I won't stand in exactly in the middle of the road, but um, just to give you some idea of the terrain that we're in. Let's flip the camera. This is Washington Pike. 
looking up the pike towards Washington DC itself. So, as you can see, the, uh, the land does rise slightly up there. In the distance, there is an American flag, and that's about where Barney's men were on the slight rise at the top of that hill. So, let's, uh, Orthodox Church, let's uh, move back down the bank and get out the way of the traffic. So the road to Washington DC is now open. It's been opened by this British assault here at Maryland, at Bladensburg, Maryland. The casualties have been reasonably light on both sides, to be honest. Not that many men killed um, in relation to the number of men engaged. So proportionally, um, the British force being smaller, 4,500 men if you brought every single man up to bear on the field, 4,500 men. They're not all actively engaged because of the narrowness of the front getting across that bridge and the narrowness of getting across the ford. But 4,500 men and about 6,200, 6,500 uh, American troops. So the casualties are about even on both sides, um, numbering in the hundreds. So proportionately, per number engaged, uh, the British suffer more casualties per number engaged. But the Americans are completely routed. Their army is not withdrawn in good order. Those militia units have broken and scattered to the winds. This becomes known as the Bladensburg races. So a poem is written, a satirical poem is written, because not only do the troops break and run, but General Widener runs, Secretary of State Monroe runs, James Madison gets on his horse and rides hell for leather to get the hell out of here. I mean, what is the President of the United States doing on a field of battle anyway? It's not a spectator sport, but there he is on a horse spectating this battle. Uh, does not seem very wise. Anyway, so the militia has run and the leadership has run and there's not much honour to be gained on the American side except by Barney and Barney's men. As I say, Barney was wounded. He is found on the battlefield by a young British officer who identifies him as like, well, clearly he's somebody important. You know, he's got a cock hat and some gold braid. Ask him who he is. And he says, you know, I'm Commodore Barney. They sub him and... Major General Ross, uh, Major General Ross summons Admiral Cockburn and they both have a conversation with the wounded Barney and on the account of Barney's heroism Cockburn has believed that with that small mosquito fleet of gunboats that the fight that those gunboats put up against Cockburn at St Leonard's and for this year up and down the river they've been a frustration to him but also he recognises the skill and the leadership with which Barney led that detachment. They're also very impressed by the leadership and the steadfastness that he displayed here at Bladensburg and his men displayed here at Bladensburg. And he's wounded on the battlefield. He could have been taken prisoner. Instead of taking him prisoner, they grant him instant parole. So on your word of honour as a gentleman, we release you. Um, Please don't fight us again. Obviously, he's not going to fight them again because he's wounded. But that allows Barney to leave the battlefield, although wounded, with honour. So that's the conclusion of the battle, the phase of the battle of Washington that takes place here on the field at Bladensburg. And that evening, the British troops will march into an undefended Washington, D.C. People have fled. The civilian population has mostly fled. Government officials have fled. The troops have fled. And um, Ross orders the destruction of Washington, D.C. It's in retaliation for the Americans burning uh, York, Ontario during the earlier invasion of Canada at the beginning of the war. So he sees this as an act of revenge. Uh, he orders his men only to destroy government buildings. Private property is to be respected and only government buildings to be destroyed. So 
they burn the White House, they burn the Capitol, um, they burn the Executive Mansion, they burn the Navy Yard. Um, they don't burn the Patent Office. They're about to burn the Patent Office when the Secretary of the Patent Office comes out and remonstrates with Colonel Ross and says, the building is a government building, but the contents of this office, the patents in them themselves, because um, remember, it's not just filing in this period. You don't just file if you've invented a new um, pulley for hauling rope. You don't just file it on a piece of paper with a drawing. You actually have to physically make a prototype and submit that as well. So all these prototypes and documents are stored at the Patent Office. So the Secretary of the Patent Office remonstrates with uh, General Ross and says, if you burn the Patent Office, you'll be destroying private property. And not only will you be destroying private property, that this is like valuable um, scientific and industrial and commercial property that is of benefit to all of mankind. And General Ross says, fine, fair enough, you got me. We will not burn the Patent Office. Um, the other building that is not burned, that is spared, is the Marine Barracks. They burn the Navy Yard, but they don't burn the Marine Barracks. So, the folklore of the battle says that out of respect for those 120 Marines that fought here under Captain Miller on the battlefield of Gettysburg, at Gettysburg, at Bladensburg, that when the British troops reach Washington DC, amongst those British troops, of course, are uh, a battalion, 2nd Battalion of Royal Marines, and also detachments from the ships, and marine detachments from the ships, and also a light company of Marines and two companies of Colonial Marines. So a strong body of Royal Marines is amongst the British troops that arrives. And the folklore says that the respect shown by the Royal Marines to the United States Marines is what spares the Marine barracks. Um, whether that's true or not, I don't know. It just may have been a convenient barracks. But if they were thinking, well, we need to leave a detachment here for a day or two to continue wrecking the town and searching for documents, etc., etc., and we don't want them sleeping out in the street, um, so we'll just use that barracks. So that may have been the, you know, as Occam's Razor, Occam's Razor goes, it's more likely to have been, well, we need the building to sleep in rather than uh, from our sense of honour, etc., etc., etc. So Washington, D.C. is put to the torch and is burning merrily. Um, but luckily for Washington DC, that night a thunderstorm and um, by some reports a tornado a storm blows through the capital, extinguishing the fires. And at which point in the morning, uh, General Ross and Admiral Coburn say, well, you know, we've done all we're going to do here. We don't really need to um, garrison a smouldering ruin, so let's go back and do something else. And what they will think of doing next is, of course, attacking Baltimore, that nest of pirates further up the Chesapeake. Uh, bay and uh, that's an entirely separate battle and would be an entirely separate tour. I just wanted to come down here and I will flip the camera because as you can see the the uh, mud bank um, here in the river this is where the ford crosses it's the shallowest point here in the river so there's a sandbar there um, showing where the low point in the water is and on the far bank there where the farm track comes across route, route where that backhoe is that cat backhoe there's actually a drop down from the track there and a slight drop down from the track on this side as well. So this is actually the fordable point where the 44th and the rest of Brooks Brigade came across and launched that flanking attack on the American position. So that really concludes the tour today. I think we've gone a little bit longer than I intended to. I've gone about 50 minutes rather than 45 minutes. So sorry for slightly overrunning there. I'm trying to keep these tours down to between 30 and 45 minutes, but um, there was a little bit of land to ground to cover today and a lot to talk about particularly with the aftermath. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the tour today. I hope it was interesting to you. Um, the War of 1812, as I said at the beginning, is um, not a very well studied war. A lot of people don't know what even what the War of 1812 was about. Um, and even amongst academic historians, so not school teachers like me, but amongst academic historians, um, weighty learned people with um, uh, PhDs and pointy heads, even amongst these guys and girls and um, they're having this debate about, well, what were the causes of the uh, War of 1812? So people have written doctoral theses on that and still having that debate. So if you don't know what the War of 1812 is about, and if your opinion on the War of 1812 differs to mine or somebody else's, like, join the club. So the War of 1812 is not well studied. In, in school, we are, um, particularly, we concentrate on the AMREV, American Revolution, Rev War, and we concentrate on the Civil War uh, causes of um, Civil War itself and, and then on Reconstruction and we kind of like 
gloss over the War of 1812 because this is a period in which we really want to talk about um, uh, Jacksonian politics and Indian removal and Manifest Destiny of the Movement West. So the War of 1812 gets short shrift in like AP US curriculum and, and teaching in school. So it's not a very well known um, war. The battles of that war are not very well known about. We know usually about the Battle of New Orleans um, because we have that Perry Como song, the Battle of New Orleans. And, uh, you know, Andy Jackson standing on top of cotton bales fighting off the British with Kentucky long rifles, etc, etc. Um, uh, we know about possibly the burning of Washington, D.C. And uh, we know that the Star Spangled Banner comes something to do with Baltimore and rockets, red glare and a flag. We know something happened up there. Um, but really in the War of 1812, that's usually about as much as um, a high school student or middle school student is going to take away from that and we don't really get into um, the, the naval campaign up and down the Chesapeake in that 1813-1814 period. We don't talk about the Mosquito Fleet, very important. Um, small men, uh, um, you know, uh, men in small boats up and down the river fighting really what's essentially literal L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L, littoral, as in the littoral, the shoreline littoral, and um, riverine warfare. So uh, very much a contemporary theme in um, uh, low intensity and counter intensity, uh, counter insurgency, low intensity counter insurgency warfare is this command of the littoral coast and command of the uh, uh, riverine estuaries, and so that's really um, prefigured by uh, Barney in 1812, 1813, 1814. So um, there's all these other battles that take place, of course, up in Canada and on the western frontier, but. Um, Battle of Bladensburg, the Bladensburg races, August 24th, 1814, um, along the Anacostia River in Maryland, close to the Washington DC line. Uh, the American defeat here is perhaps the most ignominious defeat in American military history. So you might think it's the fall of Saigon, you might think it's the war's withdrawal from Afghanistan, um, you might think it is uh, lost battalions, you might think it is an action of the Civil War, uh, it's not, it's really here um, where the American army turns and runs. Um, that gives the British a sense that, well, this is going to be easy, we'll go up to Baltimore and the militia are going to run there. No, they won't, it's going to be a completely different story at Baltimore. So, um, as I say, that will be another tour and another story. So thank you for joining me today, I hope you're enjoying these lunchtime tour series. Um, I'm certainly enjoying them, it gets me out of the house on the Tuesdays, which is my day off, so I'm getting out of the house, getting out to some battlefields, um, expanding my own knowledge and trying to share some of that with you as well. So um, if you like what you've been seeing, thank you. Um, drop some comments in this video. I will answer them as soon as I um, get indoors to a place where I don't have as much screen glare and I can see what's being written. Um, I'm going to go and grab myself a coffee in a little bit. Um, uh, like and subscribe to the Facebook page, facebook.com slash walking the ground, which is how a lot of you found this today. I will also upload this video to YouTube later this afternoon. I'll take a recording of this video, upload it to YouTube. Um, follow me on Twitter slash walking the ground. And um, thank you very much for the support that you've been giving me. Um, really do appreciate it. Really uh, do appreciate the number of you that have been joining these um, video tours on Tuesdays. Next week, next Tuesday, so Tuesday the 28th, um, we'll be back out at Gettysburg and we'll be talking about the 151st Pennsylvania, the school teachers regiment and uh, particularly their fighting on the first day of battle, July 1st, 1863, along McPherson's Ridge and then along um, Seminary Ridge in defence of the Lutheran Seminary as part of First Corps, John Reynolds' First Corps and then of the, when Reynolds falls it becomes Doubleday. Uh, Abner Doubleday leading the retreat of 1st Corps that day. So 151st Pennsylvania, the School Teachers Regiment. That will be next Tuesday, same time, and I really hope to see you there. Thank you, everybody.